Okay, take two. Let's see if we can get Jill on here. Okay, so I'm going to invite her again. I just re-invited you. I'm sending her that invited her. And let's see where we're at with that. Let's see if she can get it. Did you get it? Okay, I can type with one hand, people. That's crazy, huh? Okay, maybe it's not crazy. Maybe that's how everybody does things. So we're gonna talk about loss and death and dying. And I'm really excited about this conversation. May need to get on the phone with her to get this, this going. And I would love to tag Joe, our mutual coach. Let's see if she got it. Okay. Well, she's she's seen it. Hi, Beth. How are you? Okay. So we're um go on the live feed. I can invite you in. Okay. Oh, hi, Beth. <laughs> How are you? How are you doing? Um, we're just trying to get Jill on. I'm learning how to do this. I have only, I've done a couple of these interviews. Um, and I just need to get her onto the feed. Go on my live interview. Here we go. Yes. Um, no. Uh, no. Okay. Okay. All right. So here we are. Um, and let's make sure we get off the video chat. So we're going to get this and I'm going to relax because I'm not supposed to have adrenaline in my body. I think we're still on video chat, which makes things more complicated. Okay. So if I can get Jill on the feed here then I can invite her in, and then we can bring your friends in, which is kind of cool. So I just need to see that Jill is online. Hey, Sean, how are you? Um, just trying to figure out this interview process. It's been a while since I've done one. Okay. Okay, awesome. We, I think we're doing it. There we go. There we go. Hey, okay, we did it. Takes a little bit. Well, you know, I, I, you're my third. So, I mean, I'm not completely a virgin, but I kind of sort of, it's been a while. Uh -huh. I, um, so welcome, Jill Johnson Young. Um, to Thank this you. Opportunity. I, I'm actually really excited about this conversation. I didn't know how excited I was until it I wasn't left. working out. <laughs> oh no. Well, yeah, there was that true. I did. I did have a kind of an expectation and I can, I, I can work on that later, but um, you know, we've been around the same circles, but never really got to know each other. Right. And it's kind of like, wow, what an opportunity. Yes. Um, so there's so many things I want to ask you and what is your time constraint so I can honor that? Um, I've got maybe half an hour, 40 minutes. Okay. So however this goes, it will be very organic. Um, okay. I am really curious and you know, I kind of go to those deep places. So I apologize in advance for anything that, um, maybe one of those subjects, cause I'm, I'm okay with going there and mm -hmm. you are so relevant in my life right now. 
Um, so what made you start writing these books? Oh, my kids books and my grief book. That was because I did hospice for a really long time. And oh. it was, I did a lot of pediatric. I specialized in Florida and pediatric hospice. Wow. And so because of that, um, I worked with a lot of kids who were losing siblings uh -huh. and there were just no books that had real people in them who really died. There were adorable books that had every kind of animal on the planet dying yes. and they had all kinds of other pe things in them that had died. And I love those books. Um, Badger's mm. Parting Gifts is one of my favorites, mm. but Kids need to know that when someone's in a hospital bed that you can crawl up in with them if, as long as an adult helps you and that you can say goodbye mm -hmm. and you can say you're sad that they're dying and mm -hmm. you can talk about the things that you're going to miss about them that they'll always hold on to about them because those are important things for kids to be able to say. Um, and they also need to know that if someone is very sick and they're going back to the doctor that that doesn't mean they're going to get well. It just means that they're going to gain management. That's all. Right. And so um, I work on those kinds of things with them um, in those books. And then I also have helps for big people because I get a lot of calls at the office. And when mm -hmm. I do public speaking um, in a general forum, I get a lot of questions about, well, grandma's dying. Do we tell our child? Well, what are you going to tell your child when grandma dies if you don't tell them grandma died? Grandma just went away and decided not to, you know, see you anymore. You know, grandma died, grandma's dead, and we need to grieve grandma, and we need to do those things. Um, and that there's a funeral, and this is what happens at a funeral. And no, we don't hide the fact that the funeral is coming because four-year-olds can go to funerals as long as they've got something to do in the pew. Um, and kids can go to visitations, but you probably want to get there early so they can um, do whatever they're going to do first without all the adults who might be a little judgy coming in. Mm. And there's things in there like we don't ever lift a child up to a casket and force them to kiss a dead person. Oh, Because dead okay. people yes. don't feel the same. Right. right? Of course not. I mean, I'm married to a mortician and morticians do wonderful work and they make people who've died look very peaceful and restful as to the best of their ability. But when you reach into a casket, we still all sort of have that weird expectation that they're going to feel like a live person and they're not. Mm -hmm. Right. So we, we do those sorts of things um, in the book so that folks have something to talk about and they can talk to their kids knowledgeably and they can, Acknowledge that maybe they're going to be a little bit edgy because they're sad somebody died, too. Right, right. Um, so we, we do those sorts of things. Yeah. So I'm trying to turn this phone off, and I don't know how. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> tech, right? Um, right. I'm going to so, grab my poodle and put her up on the couch again. Uh, there we go. I understand. Mine might come back here. I'm at my home office right now, so mine might come back here as well. I know that you uh, have animals at your office, which is amazing. I have two. We have three poodles that come to the office. That's so wonderful. they're fabulous poodles creatures. Are, poodles are better for um, dander and stuff, right? They have no dander. They don't shed. Mm -hmm. um, and we only have seniors because young poodles are too much poodle. <laughs> Got it. They really okay. are. Well, young kids are too much adrenaline. I um, sometimes for me. Um, so, what is the subject matter you're going to be speaking of? Is it both at IE Camp and Camp that you're speaking on the same subject? Oh, I'm doing it slightly differently. Um, the one at IE Camp that's going to be this month on the 22nd is about um, how to talk to your grieving client. So it's mm -hmm. got a lot of information built into the front of it about um, the dying process, about how to um, understand and use correct words so you can use corrective language. Because a lot of clients come in and yes, they're grieving, but they're also traumatized. Well, and absolutely. We, may not, <laughs> we may not see them as traumatized because, oh, well, it was a, a normal death, a natural death, they died at home. Mm -hmm. But if they weren't well prepared for what they were mm -hmm. going to see, hear, and experience, 
-hmm. It's not going to be the same as someone who had a good hospice in there teaching them and helping them and walking them through it. And so there's a lot of language choices that we'll get, we're going to be talking about. We're going to talk about mm. the really helpful things people say that turn out to be not so helpful. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I, have I a, love stuff yeah. that. Like, you know, well, at least they're in a good place. Well, you know, that's really not going to help them in that moment. You know, every grieving person I've ever dealt with has said, I hate that one. I know. Right? Because know. a better place is back here with me, next to right. me. And right. then if they say, if they actually say that to the person talking to them, that person will say, yeah, but they were sick. Yeah, but I'd right. really rather them not have gotten sick and still be here. We can go all the way back if you want, but I but rather it, would have them here. Doesn't that minimize their feelings? It minimizes everything about the loss. Yeah. And it and tells it, them that they should be glad, in fact, that somebody has died. Uh, right. Why and, should and I be glad someone I love died? Well, not, um, I mean, there's a process, right? We go through and at some point, maybe you get there, maybe you don't. Um, it depends on who and what and how it happened and all of that. I mean, I work with this all the time myself and I, I find that certain cultures and, and people in general, I think um, are so uncomfortable with feelings that they, uh -huh. it's really their own uncomfortability with the feelings that causes them to say these kinds of things that are not so helpful to others when someone dies everybody wants to say something yeah and really what someone who's grieving usually needs myself included is put your arm around me and just sit exactly don't exactly. say any I, words right i so my goodness you or i are on the same page because um i'm planning on speaking about my uh my own personal trauma story. And my goal is to have people that sit in the back and if somebody runs out, that they would just sit with them and not say a word. And right. if that person then asks, you know, starts to speak, that they, they get feedback on what they need mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. they say anything because it's not about fixing that thing, but about just sitting in that precious moment with that person. When therapists do grief work, we are truly holding space. Yes. It is the number one time in my experience, and I do trauma work, and I do adoption work. I do all the usual therapist stuff. Mm -hmm. It's grief that you hold the space. Wow. I mean, I, 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 the Trauma and Healing Foundation, that's, you know, that's why I created mm -hmm. that, because my understanding, because my own traumatized life, and understanding that holding the space is such a privilege. Mm -hmm. And I don't think therapists get that to the nth degree sometimes. And I think hospice care, when my mom was passing, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, oh, they got it. They got hospices it. Hospices I mean, can be really good. Hospices sometimes aren't really good. Um, they can be, well, they can be burnt out. And they That's sometimes good. are it just depends. Florida had a different hospice system than California does. Um, and so there aren't so many hospices running around. So they really invest in their families that they're working with. Mm. And what people don't know is that you can fire your hospice and get a different one. It's a right. Medicare carve out. It's an insurance carve out. You can go to any one you want. Yeah. So you should find the one that helps. But lots of times doctors don't tell people that they need hospice until far too late because doctors are human too. And they don't want to be seen as giving up or not caring. And so they will keep going and going and going and not say hospice. Families that have hospice earlier do better. Yeah, it's kind of like, um, you know, I do these unmasking sessions and the, to take off the mask because I believe healing is through connection. And if we don't take off the mask, how do we connect? I mean, that's the way that I go about my uh, my practice. I know that goes counterproductive to everything that we're taught. And it's, it's I have difficult. my own paradigm of grief and I work within that and it works really well for me and for my clients. So I think right. whatever, I, whatever works for the that. client is what's right. Right. So it's about the client's needs and about mm -hmm. putting them first and whatever that thing is that they need. I mean, 
to me, it's an intuitive thing as well as a check-in with the client. Mm -hmm. It just depends in that moment with that person, really in that, that moment. Mm -hmm. So you are, you said you're switching it up for, um, when you speak in, uh, at the main camp. At statewide? Yes. Yes. Statewide is titled grief doesn't have to equal forever. And I, I did throw the equal sign in there for a, a reason because my paradigm for grief, mm -hmm. and again, this is me, but it works for me, is mm -hmm. that um, if you are prepared for the loss and if you use your grief time as work time, if you use that to finish up everything that's left over mm -hmm. and really address them head on, if you look at the person who died in your relationship with them realistically, and you finish that piece up, if you reorganize, because grief time is reorganization time, and the people who survive the grief process, the long-term survivors, not the ones who die shortly, those are the ones who spend grief reorganizing. And it can be any kind of reorganization, which is why this works for me as a social worker, because it's financial, and it's emotional, and it's people, and it's um, all the different things that make up us. It's sometimes as little as putting bills mm -hmm. on auto pay if you're not remembering to do stuff. But it's all that reorganization. If, if they spend the grief time doing that, then we reframe the times that you still are going to miss somebody. That's not, to my mind, that's not grief. When you have finished the relationship, you will always have moments where you miss someone. Always. Always. Yeah, yeah. But if you can find a spot, if you figure out how to put them in your new life and take them with you, with room for those missing moments, with room for reorganizing how you do a special events that they would be part of, so they're still part of it, then you're done with the grief and you're, you've got your life that you've reorganized that they're still part of. Because the reality is after someone dies, we still talk to them, every last one of us. I've never met someone who's lost a loved one who is an important part of their life that they don't refer back to when they're making big decisions when they're having relationship issues, when there's another loss coming, even buying a car yeah. in the back of your head. So would they like this or would they not? Right. That's when I have my dad moments because I know what he'd think. Right. He was the practical one. So right. we have to, we read, yeah, that's it's... not me grieving him. That's me acknowledging he was in my life. He's still part of my life. Mm -hmm. I've incorporated him into me, but I'm not grieving and so I don't, I don't want my clients leaving their first session with me thinking that what they've heard is that grief lasts forever. It doesn't have to. And to me, grief lasts forever really feels kind of like you're going to be Eeyore for the rest of your life. And right. well, that's especially and, and, not me. And, and actually, you know, I've heard it said that um, sometimes when we stop grieving, we feel guilty, like we're moving on. And those are the like, words we know, never use. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm not sure if you're aware, but I lost a son um, a couple yes. of years ago, an adoptive son. And so really these epiphanies, these things, this reorganization that you talk about is so relevant to me today because really I turned that corner in Kauai. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's interesting, I had to fly all the way to Kauai to do that. But in that moment, that's what happened. And I went from grief to, um, to just missing in mm -hmm. that moment. And that was, mm -hmm. that was so powerful, but I've never heard it said the way you have talked about it, the reorganization, the, those epiphanies, that reframing, um, missing, but not grieving. I, I get this to the core of my being has happened in the last four or five weeks of my life. It's a powerful moment. And to, with me, the work that I do, I'm very solution focused mm -hmm. probably because I'm a social worker and I like to get things done. Get done. Mm -hmm. When I hear someone come in and they tell me I've been grieving for 10 years and I've seen three therapists, my first thought that I try not to say out loud, but sometimes I do. <laughs> Who the heck were you seeing? <laughs> exactly. And what have right. you been doing all that time? Because that shouldn't right. happen. Right? They died. Right. It's part of mm -hmm. life. People die. And we have to work through that. And they mm -hmm. get to stick with us. We don't put them away. We don't get over it. We don't mm -hmm. end it. There is no acceptance. That's, that term goes to, that's for the folks who are dying. 
Yeah. Kubler Ross did amazing work, and I love yes. her work, and I love that yeah. she got us talking about dying. Yeah, but she yeah. worked with dying people, and they don't right. get a choice because they're going to die. There's no way out of this one. So there is acceptance there, but people who are grieving are going to, when they show up for a funeral, they've accepted someone has died because they're at the funeral. It's, are they done with the relationship? Have they finished everything up? Is that bucket list finally done? Have they said their apologies? Have they voiced the apologies they wish they'd heard that they didn't get to hear? Um, have they said the important things out loud that they needed to say that they didn't get to say when the person was still alive? What's left so that they can wow. finish that up? Because once you finish that and you've really said, you know what, this person who died is still part of me, really, truly still part of me. I still hold on to these parts of them. And when I work with families, everyone has a different thing that they're holding on to that's part of them now because everyone has a different relationship with a dying person or the person who died. So everyone has a different grief process and of everyone course. has different gifts that they keep from that person that they treasure. When I ask my kids who, what, they re, what they see of their mamas in them, because I've lost two wives, um, they have different gifts and they're completely disparate. They're very different. Mm -hmm. But they're really important to them, and they really do refer to those, and that's part of what they've inherited from that. That's important. But well, that doesn't mean humanity. that they've forgotten them. That means that they're part of them, but they still get to go outside and enjoy the sunshine and go to Disney and do the mm -hmm. things that people do. People who are mm -hmm. grieving don't have to feel guilty for smiling. Absolutely. And I know that some people, as an illusion of protection, withhold the emotional affect that we say, you know, that, that, uh, that emotion sometimes, unless it's sad, they might frame that up as okay. But the, the, the happy, joyous stuff sometimes is not. And that's the interesting thing is there are rules about grief that right. they don't tell you about, right? I'm sure you ran into yeah. those when your son died. There's all oh, these yeah. rules and the rules are you can't look too happy, but don't look too sad. Cause if you look too sad, you make other people sad. Right. And don't talk about them too much because then that makes people feel weird and awkward. But don't not talk about them because then you've forgotten about them. <laughs> right? You can't win. <laughs> grieve fast, grieve slow. Do There's all these weird rules that go along with it. So I make sure that the people I work with and that I talk to online hear very clearly, there is nothing to feel guilty about. Whatever emotion and need mm -hmm. that you have, that's okay. Yeah. It really, really, it's valid. Parents get, that's why the other reason I wrote the kids books is that adults get a little weird when kids are sad one moment and then they want to go outside after the funeral and go swing on the swing set. They're being kids. Mm -hmm. That's normal. Mm -hmm. Let them go swing on the swing set. They don't have to be sad every hour of every day. You might be, but they're not. Well, Maybe I we should follow their it. example. <laughs> when, I, when I walk through it with my children, I watch each one of them have their own response. And of course, everybody has mm -hmm. their own grief process and and it was just interesting because because they're all different because as humans we're all unique and right their their process is their process and my process was my process and to me I honored theirs and I honored mine and it was okay for me to grieve and and that's important I, yes it is you have to tell yourself I get to grieve I'm going to grieve in my way, in my time. And what anybody else says really doesn't change my process. That's a, that's a, a skill that a lot of people don't have. And yeah. they don't feel comfortable saying, no, this is, this is my way. Mm -hmm. um, I need to do it this way. I do a lot of work with the Death Cafe group at the Ali program at Cal State Fullerton. Mm -hmm. And they are fabulous. Yeah, they are so fabulous. It's all... It's all seniors, and they're all very much in touch with the fact that mm -hmm. they're seniors. They've even mm -hmm. got a writing program called um, Publish Before You Perish. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they have a death cafe that meets once a week, and I go yeah. down about once a semester. And I was mm -hmm. there one time when someone had just lost um, a, an important person in their life, and they, they voiced it while I was speaking. And everybody started, you know, well, you look so good. And I said, wait, stop. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. let's just wow. honor the fact that someone that she loved just died let's have her you tell know. us a little bit about them 
right? Let's let her express it. And let's not yeah. one of us say, oh, you're so strong for being here because nobody should use that word at all. So let's well, you just wouldn't be give her the space. space. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And you know, what's really interesting. I went to my high school reunion and I went to Fullerton High and I went to Cal State Fullerton and Fullerton College and all those places there. So I grew up there and we had a high school reunion mm -hmm. and right in the middle of the reunion, somebody passed that was supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. And they and they, there was somebody, a pastor that happened to be there and he made the announcement. And I mean, the truth is, as we get older, this stuff is going to be happening more and more. Maybe not necessarily in the middle of the reunion when we, you know, are expecting them to be there any second. Um, that would be my a reminder. You know, <laughs> yes. it's, it's just a reminder mm -hmm. of and. And currently I'm walking through, you know, diagnoses after diagnoses that keeps telling me I'm dying. And I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but, mm -hmm. but I made it through the last one. And to me, if we don't have a positive outlook, then, then we can't, I don't know if I would, it's like we choose life at any time. I think we can have a positive outlook and then we can also choose to be realistic. And your and reality is you're going to, you're going to keep doing this and you're going to stay here. If someone, right. I do a lot of work with chronically to terminally ill folks. And when someone comes in yeah. and says, you know, I think I just don't want to do this anymore. My family's not listening. Right. Then we have a family meeting to prepare them for, we're going to stop using the, the fighting words and the mm -hmm, kicking cancer, mm -hmm. sass words. And we're going to stop all that because yeah. their fight is, they are now going to choose to how, how they're going to live out the rest of their life and how they're going yeah. to use, spend that time. And we're not any one of us going to criticize mm -hmm. them for a really important decision. Right. That, we're going to support shift. that. Like I went mm -hmm. through with my mother, that whole thing of, you know, the palliative care and, you know, not, we're not going to fight anymore. We're not going to do chemo anymore. We're not going to do those things anymore, but we're going to keep them comfortable mm -hmm. and let them enjoy the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. there, there's so many, um, I mean, this is, you know, life and death is all like, we're all on a spectrum somewhere in there that it's going to touch us, right? It's, we are all going to have the universal experience of loss multiple times in our lives. Mm -hmm. And eventually all of us are going to die. That's a given. Yeah. And that's so a given. my kids are like, mom, you know, you're going to die someday. I'm like, yeah, I know that honey. Like, I mean, you know, reality is there's not one of us that's going to get away from that one. And I think I would, part of the reason I do the work I do is because I was blessed in a way to come from a family where my parents were the oldest parents in school. And so we had, and we had a family tradition of people marrying with wide ranges of ages. So we had a lot of really older people in very close generations. So there were a lot of funerals mm -hmm. and my parents treated it as it's a funeral. We're going to go. My dad always wore the same funeral suit. He had his hand on our shoulders. We were good to conduct ourselves however we needed to. We learned that death is part of life. We learned not to be afraid of a mortuary or a casket, you know, that you participate, you can talk about them, that you honor the person who died and mm. still talk about them afterward. That was the norm for my family. And that's not the norm in most families. No, it's most not. Most folks are afraid of death and they won't talk about it. Well, because, you know, I'm doing a, a speaking engagement uh, in a little while. Um, I call it the keeper of the secrets. And we keep this stuff inside and we don't talk about it. And then, you know, it becomes toxic, you know, that like mm -hmm. poison in our body if we don't let it go somewhere. But our culture and the people around us, um, depending upon where we are, most places are so uncomfortable with it that where do we process this is such important work. Amazing. And that's why I write books and talk about solution focused grief and why I talk about grief with a sense of humor, because you really have to. I, yeah. I made a really good friend who um, has recently done a TEDx talk and she's got a book about um, when um, one of her grandchildren's relatives died and uh, talking about comparing it to blowing bubbles. And she does clown work mm -hmm. in, in loss. That kind of stuff to me helps normalize death across the board and makes it more approachable. And that's really important 
We need to make it something you can talk about. We need to be able to go home and talk to our parents and say, okay, you haven't said anything about this, but what do you want when you die? What, what are mm -hmm. we doing? Are you leaving it all on my shoulders? Because if you are, I'm going to figure that out too. But tell me what you want. I want it to be your way. So, well, you know, that's so interesting because with my kids, I have been very purposeful with that. And they mm -hmm. always say to me, we can't talk about this. I don't want to talk about this. But I'm like, honey, just so you know, there's a will and everything's covered. So, you, you know, if and I mean, I did this years ago. I did it from the time they were babies, making sure that those things were there. But as they've grown up, they like, Shh, I don't want to talk. And I'm like, honey, this is normal stuff. Like, I know it's uncomfortable for you to think that, you know, mom's not going to be there someday, but you know, mom's not going to be there for the rest of, you know, creation. So, you know, I, and, and it's more, um, you just don't know how anybody's going to react. I've raised my kids with this normalized and still, still, they, they don't, don't want to talk about, about it, it with, mm -hmm. about me mm -hmm. because I'm their person. Yeah. And I don't try, I'm not telling folks to be, you know, overly um, overdo it with their kids. I want kids to, even our adult kids not have to, you know, focus on it, but they need to know what somebody wants. I need, I know what my mom wants now. Right. And I right. also give, the other thing I, I do with my clients is sometimes parents leave kids with instructions not to have a service. You're not allowed right. to do not do anything. And I tell them you can certainly honor that at the moment, but you can always have a redo. You right. can do something to honor them. You can do a service of your own. You can do a celebration. We need to mark that they were here and an important part of our life. And if the service didn't go the way you wanted, which happens a lot in traumatic deaths, sure. because typically well-meaning extended family and friends sort of organize things around the primary yeah. family because they assume that they're not capable, which may yeah. or may not be true, but they don't give they don't have the experience they, they really wanted. Well, that's fine. We can redo it. We can have another one. Yes. We can, we can put another obituary in the paper if, it weren't, if those weren't your words and your memories. There's nothing wrong with a redo. Wow. Right? We let kids take tests over and over again in school. Why can't we do a funeral over? Right? Oh, no. I, I completely agree with you. I, I did exactly that thing uh, with my, my adopted son. And there's mm -hmm. Jo on. She's watching us right now. Um, and that opportunity, you're right. I mean, I just learned that about, um, <laughs> she says, oh, hello. <laughs> um, so we have the same coach. We are blessed with the same woman in our lives. And that's our, well, we have a few people in common, but, but she is one of the, the many um, people that we are blessed to have in common. And now I kind of understand why. It makes a lot more sense to me. Um, I just didn't have a chance to get to know you. And um, it, it really is, the work you're doing is amazing. And you also right now have Christina on, who's a hospice nurse extraordinaire. And Andrew, who is amazing with grief and one of the primary organizers of the International um, Death, Grief, and Bereavement Conference in Wisconsin. And Colleen, who's one of our staff. And, several, and Rob McMurray, who has walked yes. through grief with a lot of people. So yeah, we've got some amazing people we got, here. We, we do, and hopefully they'll follow you and, and yours will follow me so they, they can get to know that we do similar kinds of work. That's why I created the Trauma and Healing Foundation because of the traumatic stuff that I went through that I, as um, <laughs> a grief talker, she is so cute. Um, so um, the, the point was to make a difference in our community with trauma. In, in mm -hmm. so many different, unusual, exquisite ways, somatic uh, ways, uh, interesting, you know, EMDR and all that. But there's so many out-of-the-box solutions that I am learning about that I am supporting and standing behind. Because grief, you know, sometimes to, to, to heal at the cells of your body, you got to use unique experiential kinds of treatments. You do. And you also have to take good care of yourself. The first thing I tell a grieving person that walks into my office, especially if there's been a long-term illness is you got to go to the doctor. I know you've been ignoring it because everybody yeah. does when they're caregiving, you need right. to go get some labs right. done. You need to right. check your B and D levels. I'm not a doctor, but I'm telling you, you need to do this. Um, exactly. I need you to go outside in the sun for 30 minutes every day and forget mm -hmm. the SPF factor. Go get some sun. 
you need to eat some green vegetables and some protein. And I know you're carving out, but I want you to put some something proteinish on top of the ice cream and put something green <laughs> exactly. in whatever else you're eating. You don't have to have kale. Nobody ever has to have oh, kale. Green. But you oh. gotta have the green stuff, you gotta have the protein stuff. You need to figure out how to get some naps because grieving people don't sleep. They yeah, are never they asleep at two in the morning. Two yeah. in the morning it's is a natural bio yeah. it's a biorhythm. It's a one that our body set up many, 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 many centuries ago and we don't sleep mm -hmm. from about two to about four or until yeah. the sun starts to come up, which is now coming up too early because of this silly time change thing we just had to do. <laughs> so right. um there's all those sorts of things you have. There's a lot of holistic stuff that goes with grieving. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's also the self-care, which involves the laughter and the smiling and finding mm -hmm. other people who smile. Yeah. I send, I send my local grieving people up um, a park we have here in Riverside called Mount Rubido. And if you're oh, not from Southern California, you don't mm -hmm. know Mount Rubido, but it's a very yes. tall hill and yeah. it's got a historic trail yeah. with all kinds of cool architecture. People love to hike. Yeah everybody's up there. Everybody's got a dog. Everybody's yeah. smiling. And you get yes. to the top and you see this glorious view all the way around yeah. 360. Yes. And you come down and your heart just feels lighter. Plus you've had some yeah. exercise, some sunshine. And since you're grieving, people mm -hmm. don't tend to smile at you when they know you. Yeah. So you're seeing people who don't know you're officially grieving. So they will smile at you. Right. right. So it's, it's good for you all the way around. It's my number one holistic, how we beat grief and how we, how we mm -hmm. cope with it. And it's important. Well, I have to say, um, many, many of my clients go there too. <laughs> I'm right. wondering, you know. It's an assignment from me. But, yeah. No, I um, actually, uh, the, uh, many of my, my clients intuitively take take that on. They go there mm -hmm. themselves. It, it becomes that space that a lot of people go to. Yeah. Which is so, it's so interesting because I'm a little further away now. So I don't. Um, it's hard not to feel inspired walking up Mount Rubido when you've got the Loma Linda Lopers who are 90 years old running up right. the hill, <laughs> running straight up this hill, right? Okay, that I can keep walking shame. with my cane because they're shaming me right now. <laughs> and I don't believe in shame, so I'm going to just take that out of the picture right now. <laughs> but at the same time, um, that would put me to shame in a heartbeat. It's an inspiration, because... shall we say, yes. Okay, and I, and I believe in inspiring people to be an inspiration, and that's what they're doing. That's mm -hmm. what those people are doing. And they're showing us that you can do it until, you know, as long as you're on this earth, if you physically can, you know, and every person has to To the best of your least, ability. To right. the best of your ability, you know, t pace yourself, whatever it is that you need to do. If you can't do it, that's also okay. It's well, one whatever of the things, you can do. Right. One of the things grief does is it zaps your energy level. We have physical components, yes. there's cognitive components, there's emotional components. Mm -hmm. it's, it's beyond tired. It's this exhaustion that just lays you mm -hmm. out. And yeah. so for some of my grievers, it's, all right, if tomorrow you will go for a five-minute walk, then mm -hmm. the next day all you got to do is get out to the couch. You can even watch right. Price is Right, but you got to get up and get to the couch. And I want you to take a shower um, right. by noon. Right, that. Right. Because it's exhausting. Right. The first few weeks and months are very, very tiring. And then you build back the resilience because that's what's going to pull you through and help you through working through the process. Well, right? and you brought up the really good point is resiliency. I mean, that's so important. I, I, I know from post-traumatic stress disorder, resiliency is such an important factor. And building mm -hmm. up that resiliency again, and whether you have resiliency based on what you've gone through in your life, that is such a powerful thing and important. Clearly that's very important. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because building up resiliency, that makes sense to me about my own experience. And I, I just intuitively did that. I just didn't have a word to put to it. So thank you for, for You're very welcome. To understand um, my own process let alone what you're going to be teaching these therapists, both at IE camp and statewide camp. Um, you know, what's I... interesting is when you talk to therapists, when you go to conferences and I go to a lot of them, obviously we run into each other at them all the time. Yes. And I yes. put up my, love to learn. Yes. I sit up a table with my grief stuff yeah. and fully two thirds to three quarters of the therapists who walk by will make a circle mm -hmm. and go all the way around me because right. they don't even want to approach someone who might talk about grief with them. Right. right. It's, it's something we have to be able to do. 
they're getting closer when they circle like a part of them wants it and a part of them is like ah like you know well we're not good at it they don't teach grief in therapist school they really they don't they may have a death and dying class but yeah they don't yeah. and so we have to be able to talk about it and i've been to a couple therapists who didn't have a clue in life what to do with someone who'd had someone die and so I, and they said all those things you don't ever want to hear because they were trying to fill up the space, partly because I wasn't helping them because they were supposed to be helping me. <laughs> so I didn't feel like I needed to help them figure out what to do because it was their job to help me at that moment in my life. Uh, yeah, but we got to be able to talk about this stuff. Yeah, exactly. But we have to have done our own work. Don't you think that if we don't do our own work, it's going to show up and we it are shows up be, in everything. Uh, Secondary mm -hmm. trauma will happen, and um, we will take it home as therapists, um, even as a coach. Um, that can we 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 ha have to manage our own needs, and so that we're caring for our clients' needs, our patients' needs, whatever you want to call that. Mm -hmm. We have to do it's, our self care, and then we have to be, mm -hmm. and we have to know that we're keeping fresh, and our clients have to feel valued and know that we really want to be there with them. Yeah. That, that will always be me but you know we always we have to take our moments and uh i frequently have to get to the beach and put my toes in the sand because that's that's, that's where is, i regenerate and that's, that's where a lot where of people I, do yeah right they do and i'm planning a trip with me and my kids uh we're gonna go to la jolla and nice. for me that is um as close to Kauai in Hawaii that I get to. So uh, we always, as a family, go there, rejuvenate there. They snorkel and go crazy and keep really busy doing. And I, I'm i just a being. I just sit on the beach and I just stay still. And that's what I did in Kauai. I had my own retreat within that retreat that was a privilege mm -hmm. to be at. Um, and and so these opportunities to to take in nature Mm -hmm. I think are part of that resiliency that bring us back to who we are as well. It's that forest walking and forest washing. I'll be in Wisconsin yeah. in another couple of months and there's a, the river is right by the hotel and I just, mm -hmm. just Water. sitting by the river is just an amazing experience. And I know all you East coast people, you have rivers everywhere, but we Southern California people, not so much. Although we have them this year. It's been kind of cool. We have water We're, running. Right. <laughs> it doesn't usually happen any... around here. Right. It's true. I mean, you got to go way in the back somewhere and then find like the sound of a babbling brook or something. It's exactly right. That. We play it on, right. on YouTube. That's the only way we get that stuff around here. Well, also but. the Calm app. I do that as well with my clients. We do, you know, the YouTube sound machines, whatever, whatever. The sound of water in different ways is so calming. To it's good for your brain. People. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my brain needs it right now. <laughs> We've got the neuroscience that proves that we, we respond well to that stuff. And that's right. where when you're doing grief work with somebody, you not only want to do the holding the space and the actual work and the working through the relationship, but you also do all the other holistic stuff, the, the eat, sleep, rest, um, you know, take care of yourself, go to the doctor, acknowledge that this is all happening because you are grieving. Yes, your brain feels like it's filled with cotton batting and you are not thinking clearly the answer is mm -hmm. it is filled with cotton batting and you are not thinking clearly and know your response times are not normal and you need to be careful driving and there's all of that stuff that you do mm -hmm. just to make sure that you are normalizing it for your client and so that they know that this is real this is not them being crazy this is just what grief does <laughs> and that's why we want to work through it so it will we can get to the other side of it wow well thank you for yep. this session by the way <laughs> I feel like I owe you money. Should I sell you or something? Yeah, we, I think we do sell now. <laughs> oh, that's sure. So I've got a client coming in about five minutes. So yes. got to um, go. Thank you for the privilege of this conversation. I'm going to market you um, as best as I can. That, that's just something okay. I love to do because I think the work you're doing is tremendous. And thank well, you so much that. for this opportunity. And uh, um, enjoy your day and go bless your next client. Working on it next. Got to okay. get a cup of coffee on the wean time. Thanks and thanks Have everybody who day. watched. Andrew, I'll see you in Wisconsin mm -hmm. soon. Bye. Right. Bye-bye.